Who wants some inappropriately timed holiday movies? Huh? No one. Well, too bad. Today we're talking about Blue Christmas. Why are we talking about an Elvis song on a show about Japanese film? Well, I'm glad you didn't ask. To answer that, let's take a look at the profile of Kihachi Okamoto, the director of this classic Christmas song termed Obscure Christmas Movie. Born February 17, 1924, Kihachi Okamoto was a prominent member of a very specific generation of Japanese filmmakers. When he moved to Tokyo at the age of 17, Okamoto feared that he would be drafted for service in World War II. Thanks to this perceived inevitability, he spent all of his free time during the two years he spent in business school watching movies. At 19, he was hired by Toho as an assistant director, but as the war intensified and film production ground to a near halt, Okamoto's inevitability came to be, and he was drafted. While in military training, he was one of a small group to survive an American air raid on his academy. Okamoto was later sent to the Pacific Front, where he was assigned to a bomb squadron in the Japanese Imperial Army. In an interview, Okamoto commented, quote, You could say it's a miracle I survived the war at all, since statistics show that the largest number of people killed were those born, like me, in 1924. End quote. After World War II, Okamoto returned to his position at Toho, working under directors like Ishiro Honda, director of many of the original Godzilla films, and Mikio Naruse, a director recognized in the West posthumously for his style by labels like Criterion. In 1958, Okamoto was given his first solo project with All About Marriage, the first of his 41 directorial credits. He used his newfound position to air discontent with the war he had lived through and the conditions that had led to it, just as Kinji Fukasaku would later use Battle Royale to discuss the horrors he witnessed as a teenager in a munitions factory. Okamoto used a number of genres to discuss in blunt terms the things that he had experienced. Among the diverse genres Okamoto explored were Jidai Geki, or period films, mostly set in the Tokugawa era, Yakuza films, and straight World War II films. His contributions to this latter genre resulted later in his career with Japan's Longest Day, which details painstakingly the 24 hours between Emperor Hirohito's decision to capitulate and his radio broadcast announcing Japan's surrender. And then you have today's offering, a bizarre science fiction drama titled Blue Christmas, which concerns citizens reporting UFO sightings and subsequently developing a condition where their blood turns blue. Reportedly, this film inspired the blood type of the angels, the extraterrestrial antagonists of the Evangelion franchise being blue. Though Okamoto wrote a good portion of the films he directed, Blue Christmas was penned by Kuramoto So, a man with numerous TV dramas, film screenplays, stage plays, and books under his belt. So graduated from Tokyo University's Department of Literature, and in the course of his career has worked with numerous studios and television companies. In 1982, So would go on to win the Japanese Academy Award for Best Screenplay with 1981's Yasuo Furuta-helmed Station, a film which swept most of the major awards that year. Blue Christmas was released on November 23, 1978 in Japan. While sites like IMDb will list multiple titles supposedly used in other territories, it's important to note that Blue Christmas has never officially been released outside of Japan. But hey, it did receive a Japanese DVD release, and in spite of its steep cost, you combine that with some English fan subs and magic happens. Ah, the magic of the internet. Anyway, let's jump right into this bizarre tale and see what we're in for. As usual, if you haven't seen the film, we strongly urge you to track down a copy and make that kind of magic we were referring to, though it took quite a bit of snooping to get our copy, so I won't blame you if you give up and just go ahead with the video. Blue Christmas centers around two men. First, we have Oki, an army man coming to grips with the potential existence of extraterrestrials. On the other end of things, we have Minami, a reporter chasing down the leads on the disappearance of a certain Dr. Hyodo, shortly after presenting a report on aliens to an international council. What ties these two men together? The sudden occurrence of humans possessing blue blood, similar to animals like squid, 
which is linked with said humans having witnessed the presence of UFOs. Wrapped up in this plot are a British pop band, an up-and-coming musician, a program known as Project Blue Book, the real-world US Air Force's investigation into UFO phenomena, and a global conspiracy surrounding all of these folks and occurrences. One of the first things that one notices about Blue Christmas is how pretty it is. Cinematographer Daisaku Kimura composes absolutely gorgeous shots throughout the film, relying heavily on color symbolism. Blue, in the case of the film, provides a subtle means of portraying a change of heart. As in this scene, where Oki meets a pilot, and a neon sign lighting his face changes from red, a color of aggression, to blue. At other times, it signifies paranoia, like when we hear discussion of the rapid spread of blue blood. If you look at the extras in the crowd, almost half of them are wearing blue shirts and blue jeans. Another thing fans of 90s science fiction may have noticed is that Blue Christmas is kind of like a protracted multicultural episode of The X-Files. Really, almost all of the tropes here are there. There's a mystery that a small group think they understand the origin of. The main character must jump through hoops to meet an informant who is risking his life to tell the story of the century, at which point we find out that this goes all the way to the top. Even if Oki doesn't begin as a Mulder analog, he becomes one, as he turns into a government official wanting to do the right thing, who encounters people who are supposedly dead, but were really taken to Russia for experimentation. The only thing missing really is a skeptic, a Scully analog. So it's like Japanese Scully-less X-Files. But you know what else Blue Christmas is a lot like? It's a lot like Watergate one of the real government conspiracies that served as inspiration for the X-Files. The Watergate scandal, for the uninitiated, was an incident in which President Richard Nixon's administration covered up evidence of his party's breaking in and tapping the headquarters of the Democratic National Convention in 1972. The scandal was unraveled by Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, two reporters, and its revelation led to the untimely resignation of Richard Nixon in 1974. They were helped by an informant going by the name of Deep Throat, taking his alias from the then-recently released porn film. In the case of Blue Christmas, Minami is the investigative reporter, and Dr. Hyodo is the informant who knows too much and has to be silenced. In actuality, Deep Throat turned out to be an FBI agent named William Mark Felt, not a doctor, but this wasn't revealed until 2005, while during Blue Christmas's production, his identity was still shrouded in mystery. Okamoto may have been using his previously discussed distrust of the government and the recent occurrences half the world away to form a unique vision of intrigue and conspiracy. But how about the message of the film? Oki and the Blue Blood epidemic could be metaphors for any number of things, whether cultural, governmental, or even physical. Oki could be seen to represent the nation of Japan itself, with his beginnings as a no-questions-asked soldier correlating to Imperial Japan, particularly in the days of World War II. He's against any foreign threats at this point, but as he falls for Saiko and begins a relationship with her, he ultimately decides that the Blue Blood is safe and of little importance. This could represent post-war Japan and its seeming Americanization, with the military gunning him down being representative of how the generations before and contemporary to Okamoto viewed the next generation of children born after the war war, who would become more critical of aggression and more accepting of Americanization than the elder people of Imperial Japan. This cultural change in the times is also exemplified in the student protest that we see partway through the movie. Japan has a strong history of student activism, with most of the well-remembered incidents happening not long before Blue Christmas went into production. During the period of reconstruction that followed World War II, young people took action against the ratification of ANPO, or the Treaty of Mutual Cooperation and Security the document entering the US and Japan into a partnership following the withdrawal of American troops in the early 1950s. In 1969, Tokyo University had to cancel its entrance exam due to the sheer number of students occupying the campus in protest of the Vietnam War. 
Student protests of this time often involved violent encounters with police officers, as the students sought to challenge the new Japanese state on a fundamental level. To this day, student protests are a staple of Japanese society. Okamoto's history of making films critical of Japan's involvement in World War II makes it easy to believe that the Blue Blood could also be a metaphor regarding to political control. The film makes prominent usage of Nazi metaphor, even if we are only shown Nazi imagery directly once. The use of the term concentration camp and the obsession with xenophobia and fascism are prevalent throughout. While Minami visits New York, the Americans he encounters are all xenophobic, just as the majority of Japanese characters are xenophobic toward anyone with blue blood. There is a persistent fear of outsiders, with the Japanese military deliberately dehumanizing those with blue blood. In this manner, the film seems to be drawing a link between xenophobia and fascism. Okamoto seems to be asking, how far does xenophobia need to go before it becomes fascist? While also condemning his country for allying themselves with a group such as the Nazis. Similarly, the image of the World Trade Center, despite how brief its appearance is, has its own weight to bear. The World Trade Center was designed by none other than a Japanese architect named Minoru Yamasaki. The design was seen by Yamasaki as a symbol of unity. Yamasaki was once quoted as saying, quote, The World Trade Center should, because of its importance, become a representation of man's belief in humanity his need for individual dignity, his beliefs in the cooperation of men, and through cooperation, his ability to find greatness." End quote. And so we see this symbol of cooperation backlighting a sequence in which Minami is laughed at and ridiculed for his admittedly pretty good command of English. Despite speaking the language well enough, he is seen as an outsider in New York. He is one to be rejected. An American audience might immediately draw connections to a similar epidemic within our own recent history, that being the Red Scare of the 50s and 60s, when people were prosecuted, blacklisted from work, or abused in other ways, simply thanks to the accusation that they were communists, that they were anti-democracy, un-American, outsiders living in our midst. But with The Blue Stigma, as one of the film's alternate titles goes, the people in question have one key difference. Where a communist has no outward signs of being a communist, someone with blue blood has a very easy way to identify themselves. This means that in order to determine if someone is human in this universe, they must first be wounded, shoot first, ask questions later, and if someone turns out to be human, as we learn in the military directive from the film's climax, they can be written off as sympathizers and co-conspirators of those with blue blood. In this state of moral panic, everyone has the potential to be judged guilty until proven innocent, just as Americans might have learned was the policy during the Red Scare. In more extreme cases, like a young Frenchman that we see, they might even have a blue tongue. Or, in the case of a young star, they may have blue skin. This inherently means that, under a system which seeks to oppress those with blue blood, these people are robbed of their rights to speak, or to be seen. It also means that this way of handling blue blood will inspire fear in anyone who does not have the condition, as with Oki's commanding officer. Late in the film, we learn that he is obsessed with checking his blood constantly, having cut himself daily for quite some time, just to make sure that he hasn't changed. He views the blue blood as a sickness, but one which might infect him unknowingly. The film may be trying to tell us that, under an oppressive system of fear of one group, the need to have a scapegoat is ever-present, and that even those in high positions are not immune to becoming said scapegoat, as we see in Oki's death. The commanding officer seems to be driven to madness by his fear, but this is not necessarily his fault. He knows subconsciously that he might become the quote-unquote bad guy one day, and he lives in fear of that every day. Of course, the blue blood could also be representative of a literal disease. AIDS might seem historically like a disease that didn't exist until the 1980s, while in fact it had been reported as early as the 1920s. The misconception comes from the fact that the US CDC declared AIDS an epidemic in 1981. In order for something to be an epidemic, it has to be, by definition, widespread at a particular time. 
For something to be widespread, of course, it typically means that something began with a few cases and then expanded rapidly or even exponentially, as the blue blood epidemic does in this film. Thus, it's easy to draw the correlation between the two. Although the Ministry of Health and Welfare did not announce the first AIDS patient in Japan until 1985, which in itself is a story for another day, the virus itself has been shown to have existed at least in major centers like New York City as early as 1971. While initial numbers of infection were small, given the length of time that HIV can take to manifest as AIDS, the correlation between the film and the oncoming epidemic may be a coincidence. But whether the filmmakers knew it or not, when Blue Christmas was released, AIDS was already a serious threat, and one that we wouldn't understand for nearly a decade, lending this retroactive interpretation some credence. Blue Christmas is a bold film. It may be heavy-handed at a few points, like one sequence where Oki dreams of all the people who he has wronged, but it is notable for not quite being forthcoming with its exact message, just the general sense it tries to instill in the audience. It can be interpreted a number of ways, which provides credit for multiple viewings, and it is simply gorgeous to look at, making the multiple viewing bit even stronger. If you haven't checked it out yet, please do. And if you have seen it and have a different interpretation, please comment with it. We're both curious to see how many other ways this film's messages can be taken, given how direct yet dense it is at the same time.